everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. About the idea of purpose. I think one of the most profound things I ever learned about, um, about mission, about calling, um, about purpose came from a, a Congolese warlord. Um, but, uh, you know, so nominally, most of the people we work with are Christians. And we were visiting some of the communities we work with in eastern Congo. I'd been in a basically walking between villages for two, three days. And uh, our local director um, says to me, he says, Scott, you know, the guy who's been helping you carry your backpack for the last two days you used to lead one of the guerrilla groups. Mm-hmm. No, you're kidding. So I, I sat down to interview him with our local director translating. And um, he said, you know, men around here didn't do much. We just would sit around and play cards or we'd fight. No, women did all the work. And then your pastor came and started talking about work being a gift from God. And that I have talents that I can contribute. And I thought, maybe if I help my wife on the farm, together we could do something great. And he goes on to talk about disarming the militia that he'd been in charge of. And, and um, I, uh, you know, I'm kind of trying to grasp at some of this, the spiritual um, roots of this. And so I said, so, so did you become a Christian? And he gives me this funny look. He says, no, I've always been a Christian. I just never knew it applied to anything besides Sunday before. Mm-hmm. And it slowly <laughs> dawned on me that he'd found purpose mm. that his he realized his life was actually about something mm. and i've checked up on him followed up on him and and um this is cuz this was about 2017 you know he not only is he still helping his wife on the farm but he's going around to other communities talking about reconciliation talking about peace talking about the fact that the watershed and the care of that watershed is actually a charge that's been laid on them by God, um, you know, who put us in the garden to tend it and keep it. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Scott Saban, CEO of Plant with Purpose. Thanks for joining today. Well, thank you, Scott. You served in the U.S. Navy as a service warfare officer. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and why did you decide to leave the Navy after your service? Sure. sure. Well, I had always wanted to work on ships to go to sea. Um, I had this big romantic notion of of being a sailor, and uh, but I always knew it was not something I was going to do for a career. In fact, I'd only planned on doing it for four years. And I uh, realized one day that seven years had gone by. And uh, so I started going to graduate school at night. Kind of the, my long-term plan had been to go into the Foreign Service, into the Diplomatic Corps after the Navy. That's, uh, that's actually a great segue because the, the question that I've been asking for, and, and certainly uh, especially for those uh, you know are faithful to the Lord, and they're always asking the question of what is your will for me. And and I think you're in a unique position that you've spent some three decades in the current organization that you're at. So I'm, I wonder from a benefit of hindsight, how do you feel that God orchestrated what you thought your plan was going to be to what it ended up being in your ministry for the last 30 years? Yeah, well, there have been a, 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 some twists and turns. Um, in graduate school, I needed a foreign language in order to, in order to finished my master's degree. Um, So I spent a summer in Guatemala um, doing an immersion Spanish program. And during that time, I had my eyes opened, probably for the the first time, really, to issues of of poverty and injustice 
And, and more importantly than that, people living their faith out in a way that I'd never experienced growing up in Southern California. And I came back to finish my last semester of school, but also with the thought of, I want to be around people like that. I want to be involved in, in helping people like the little kids I'd see begging on the street. And uh, so I started volunteering at, at Plant With Purpose um, with no thought of it being a career, just a, a chance to uh, maybe learn a little bit more about uh, nonprofit work, about uh, poverty alleviation, poverty fighting. Um, and uh, over the course of time, fell in love with the mission. It was not love at first sight, though. I, the, the environmental aspect in particular threw me off. You know, I was really passionate about uh, serving poor people, helping them to uh, to break out of their poverty. But planting trees? Yeah. In fact, right. my father famously said, uh, seriously, that's what you're going to do with your life? Planting trees for Jesus? <laughs> That's a, that's a beautiful story, and it reminds me of um, a recent trip that my son in high school took. He spent some time at Dominican Republic as part of a missions trip, and he came back, and he was very much transformed. And I think a lot of it is not only seeing the poverty, but the injustice, but at the same time also seeing God at work. You know, I think yeah. definitely in a very comfortable Western world, we don't necessarily always see that in action, but he said... Some of these people that are truly passionate about the Lord, you could see it and they're living it and there is no selfishness at all. And it was interesting because he came back and had all these desire, but didn't have a compass or direction of how to try to direct that. So which brings us to plant with purpose. And I'm, I'm curious because, you know, they you guys are a very rep reputable organization, uh, lots of awards over the years. I have developed a successful model for rural agricultural development in impoverished countries. But back when you joined, like you said, when you started to volunteer back in some 1993 or so, what was the mission back then and how has it evolved over the years and maybe have even gotten sharper and more precise? Yeah, well, we always saw this connection I say we, the organization, because it took me a while. The organization always saw this connection between environmental degradation and rural poverty. Um, we realized that uh, a lot of what we think of as, as uh, intractable poverty, you know, the city slums in Santo Domingo or, or the shanty towns of Port-au-Prince in Haiti or, or what I saw in Guatemala City, those people were all basically refugees from the countryside that they'd they were had been generations of farmers. And so that what they were leaving must somehow be more desperate than what they're arriving to. And what we realized is that they had been trying to farm land that had been so badly degraded. Um, soil had been eroded. Water resources had dried up that when the land was deforested, essentially it became a desert. And, and you can't really farm a desert effectively, at least not without irrigation. Um, and so by working at that junction, we could help people both restore the land and lift themselves out of poverty. So that was that was our, our, our early vision. We have grown in our effectiveness. And probably one of the most important aspects of that has been listening and learning from the people we serve and measuring our impact and being very meticulous, very meticulous about measuring impact. Amazing. And, and that, that's really what donors want to hear, right? Because most of these uh, NGOs and nonprofits have great missions and visions, but how can you get empirical and quantitative and can you show and correlate the actual results to the funding uh, or the philanthropy dollars that's being received? Now, a couple of things. One is, the organization was doing something that was very progressive because, again, these days in 2023, the you know vernaculars of climate change, climate action, these types of th uh, things, including tree planting, is so pervasive. And I think greenwashing has really made it so that it just we just hear from one side and out the other. But you guys were doing something that was really unique and forward thinking. And I wonder back then, was that challenging? And what was the donor base like? And who are the ones that were supporting? 
And has the donor allocation or diversification changed over the years? It definitely has. Um, yeah, I, I, I used to joke that we were too Christian for the environmentalists and too environmental for the Christians. Um, I, I think a lot of our early donor base was really interested in the practical. It, you know, it worked. And so, yeah, you guys are planting trees. Yeah, you're restoring land, but it works. And so we'll support it. And now there's certainly a lot more um, of our donor base that's interested in the in the whole mission, in the fact that we are um, we're restoring land, we're mitigating climate change, we're helping people to adapt to climate change, um, and and helping them uh, uh, move from poverty to uh, to at least um, uh, sufficiency and sometimes abundance. So, you know, from my point of view, and I'm sure you know this very well, is that the value from an outsider is the fact that you have, you know, more than 30 plus years of these case studies and let's call it experimentation and, and er, er, uh, iterations. Uh, and again, it, it's in the localized, contextualized context of these different regions and countries and down to indigenous peoples and tribes and communities and so forth how it actually works, how it actually gets implemented. And the reason this is important is, you know, as of now, we're in a mess. I mean, and when I say we, I mean the world. I was in San Diego beginning of the year where you guys were getting so much rain, so much flooding, just unbelievable. I literally couldn't cross the street. And now if you look at the country, for the most part, more than three-fourths of the United States, as an example, almost no rain. You know, yeah. you get pockets of rain in the in maybe the mountaintops of Colorado and certainly the Gulf State and a little bit of New England, but the rest of the country is bone dry. And we're starting to see more of that. And people that have flocked to Europe for vacations are really finding out that uh, Italy, France, and Spain and, and you know, these countries are really hot um, and very uncomfortable. But then other regions are disproportionately getting way too much rain, Southeast Asia, um, Canada, uh, to to an extent, a lot of the equators, for example, and it's really having a significant impact, isn't it? And and I think many countries are starting to f recognize and face the fact that not only are you going to have massive movements of people, but they're going to have to figure out how to reconfigure their industries to survive. I was in Australia uh, er earlier part of the year talking about agriculture and they've had some incredible changes in their weather and despite that they've been able to have incredible production and export but what are some case studies or examples of success that listeners can think wow if it works there could we start to bring it to other parts of the world yeah well part of the way the whole program works you know first of all we address through through uh savings groups and mobilizing local capital um we address issues of of poverty and uh food insecurity but the tree planting and the land restoration is all a part of um, well not all but mostly a part of the effective farming that people do we did we ran a a recent study and learned that uh, just the agriculture without anything else um, increases production significantly. Well, that agriculture, a lot of it is um, regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, which incorporates trees into farms. And so, so there's a real synergy between the restoration of the land and, and with that, restoration of ecosystem services, improvement of water resources, ability of the soil to hold water and allow rain to infiltrate the soil um, so that what rain does fall is better utilized. Um, it's, um, it, there's, there's really a, a synergy with all of that all that to say, what is exciting to me is we, you know, we talk about the fact that uh, we've planted now 61 million trees, but it isn't us that have planted 61 million trees. It's the it's the people that we partner with. It's the local farmers, 480 thousand local farmers who are planting those trees because they make sense to their own livelihoods. 
anyway. So I, that that to me, that's really exciting. You know, we we're we're not just you know forty people in the U.S. We're four hundred and eighty thousand people in nine countries around the world. So it's interesting. Again, I think our audience is sophisticated enough in this general topic that when it comes to tree planting, there's ample amount of donations. Now, whether it makes sense all the time, that's a different debate uh, and and different set of scientific studies to support it. But instead of different organizations that are randomly just planting trees with the hope that it can somehow sequester and release more oxygen, sequester CO2 and then release more oxygen to the air, is the fact that you're thinking through an ecosystem, a, a, a structural infrastructure model so that ultimately it's this synergistic biodiversity. Because again, there are parts of the world that are heavily focused on monoculture, palm trees and many others. Sure, they're planting stuff, but it's not really helping with the, the biodiversity aspect that you're talking about. But one of the more, more important things that you're talking about that I haven't really heard as much, there is this... Uh, um, root for peace that creates agriculture out of land that used to be uh, you know, covered with mines, explosives. And they do something kind of similar in the sense of productive plants. So we're talking avocado. And I think this is what you're referring to, mango, cacao, coffee, trees that improves the soil, also helps uh, synergistically their agriculture, lagoons, and, and so forth, and being able to actually restore a lot of the native forests and trees and, and 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 be able to optimize the water resources. I think that is really critical. And I think people kind of lose that importance. So I wonder if you could just go a little bit more deeper because it's, again, it's the decision is decentralized to your point. You guys are not dictating what gets planted. Is, is that right? Absolutely. We're doing a couple of things. One is we're organizing our work around sub watersheds or micro watersheds. So because we learned that there's a, a real synergistic effect. If you work with communities upstream, they benefit communities downstream. If we can work with approximately 60 percent of the communities or 60 percent of the people in a particular sub watershed, that can really um uh, you know, maximize our impact environmentally, socially, economically. So from that perspective, we're bringing some outside planning, but then locally there's participation in, you know, somebody wants to plant uh, uh, nitrogen fixing trees and uh, um, trees that might be used for uh, fodder and, uh you know, one of the, the things that I have learned that is exciting to me is uh, our brains tend to go straight to monoculture, you know, coffee or cacao or whatever. But, you know, creation has an incredible diversity, incredible abundance, and a lot of which we're only beginning to learn how to use. Well, those local local farmers often bring knowledge of that that we don't have. And so um, their involvement brings a lot more diversity into it. Another emphasis that we push, not exclusively, but we push is native species. And in a lot of cases, regenerating native species, which can be can be really hard. Um, you know, again, the, the I think the brain goes to, well, you know, there's these fast growing trees from Southeast Asia, or there's, uh, you know, there's, a, well, you, all you, you don't have to go very far around the world to realize that, that uh, eucalyptus at one point was what everybody wanted to plant. Um, but by really tapping into local knowledge and putting an emphasis on native species, uh, we're seeing that again, that synergy between increased farm production and increased biodiversity and restoration. So what you're saying to me is profound uh, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, I think we need to recognize that over the years, uh, and NGOs and nonprofits are just as guilty, is that you know we, meaning just kind of generally speaking, tend to have a kind of a commonwealth or imperialistic mindset, meaning that from a you know parental, uh, almost like a, you know, uh, governistic type of a model where we know what's best for you. We come into a certain area and you're going to implement the best practice based on uh, studies that we have actually conducted. But what you're talking about is the respect and the nuance 
uh, and the trust and the and the transference of liability and ownership and protection to the locals so that they really own it and 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 really do it from a to z and store that and in many ways i i think that model is very congruent with christianity isn't it and and what you know christ has really taught us i mean i don't think he wanted a monolithic religion where he was dictating but he really trusted his disciples and they in turn basically amplify that so that model i think is finally starting to catch on with a lot of the ngos but i wonder despite that and some of the best practices there are undoubtedly going to be conflicts so let me just talk about some of those things water rights so you talked about you know let's say rivers or streams water sources people that benefit from water uh, and there are organizations that sometimes i want to channel that water source or or stop it so that the people downstream don't get it for instance um, a good example of this uh, and because you're in san diego is uh, california uh, it's the sierra sierra mountains and the water that comes from northern california down to southern california how do we deal with some of these issues that are rights or maybe in some cases even legal framework aspects that challenges some of the corporations yeah for, to, to a large degree we're, we work um very cooperatively with uh both local government existing local government and and even national government structures um you know facilitating conversation facilitating um reconciliation i, I want to jump back to your your earlier point though um you know, one of our core um, values, core messages, is that the people we work with are not our projects, they're our partners. And we wouldn't have been able to accomplish a tiny fraction of what we've been able to accomplish without them as partners. And when I look at a lot of what we've learned and implemented, so many of those lessons have come from our local partners, whether it's the use of savings groups, whether it's how we implement agroforestry, farmer field schools, um, the the faith leadership, the pastors and, and outreach is not coming from uh, Americans, it's coming from local pastors and, and local church leaders. Um, so, but, but then to your later point, we work very closely with with local governments and i think that that's one of the things that it's kind of interesting gets reflected back to us i don't think we always realize how good a relationship we actually have with with the gut people always ask me so what do governments think of your work well for the most part they're they, they uh occasionally like to take credit for it but uh um but are very appreciative of the fact that we work in partnership with them Let's briefly talk a little bit about the missions component of all of this. And that's really the, the primary pillars that all of this is based on. And one of the things that I'm, I'm re reminded recently uh, by some of the missionaries that I met in India, which I can't go into too much detail, is how they really spent over many, many years trying to be part of a very tribal community. And even in the process of them coming to know Jesus Christ and, and Christianity and the framework and the knowledge and so forth is how they were very thoughtful about not imposing a religious dogmatic approach, meaning mm -hmm. you have to do it this way, but understanding the nuances and integrating their culture and, and their subtlety into it Whereas I think some people in the spectrum of religion, it doesn't matter if it's Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, or anything else, tends to take a very legalistic approach. So I wonder, talk to us about the facet of missions and how you guys are aligned for that to come in a way that's contextualized for the local people. Well, um, again, a lot of that is coming from local pastors and and people who are already working within the culture, within the context. Um, we partner very closely with with churches all over the world um, or other Christian organizations um, that are are locally based, um, and and are always open to learning from them. Um, something you mentioned 
at the at the very beginning, I think before we started actually officially um, uh, talking, um, was about the idea of purpose, and uh, you know we're plant with purpose. Um, I think one of the most profound things I ever learned about um, about mission, about calling, um, about purpose came from a, a Congolese warlord. Um, but, uh, you know, so nominally, most of the people we work with are Christians. And we were visiting some of the communities we work with in Eastern Congo had been in a basically walking between villages for two, three days. And uh, our local director um, says to me, he says, Scott, you know, the guy who's been helping you carry your backpack for the last two days he used to lead one of the guerrilla groups. Mm-hmm. No, you're kidding. So I, I sat down to interview him with our local director translating. And um, he said, you know, men around here didn't do much. We just would sit around and play cards or we'd fight. No, women did all the work. And then your pastor came and started talking about work being a gift from God and that I have talents that I can contribute. And I thought, maybe if I help my wife on the farm, together we could do something great. And he goes on to talk about disarming the militia that he'd been in charge of. And and um, I, uh, you know, I'm kind of trying to grasp at some of this, the spiritual um, roots of this. And so I said, so, so did you become a Christian? And he gives me this funny look. He says, no, I've always been a Christian. I just never knew it applied to anything besides Sunday before. Mm-hmm. And it slowly <laughs> dawned on me that he'd found purpose, mm-hmm. that his he realized his life was actually about something. Mm-hmm. And I've checked up on him, followed up on him. And, and um, this is because this was about 2017. You know, he not only is he still helping his wife on the farm, but he's going around to other communities, talking about reconciliation, talking about peace, talking about the fact that the watershed and the care of that watershed is actually a charge that's been laid on them by God, um, you know, who put us in the garden to tend it and keep it. And um, so not the way I would have expected missions to work itself out but to me, really, really exciting and profound in my own life when I realized, yeah, we were created for a purpose. This is powerful. And, and I think this is exactly what I was referring to um, in, in the example of the Indian missions. Again, I can't go into too much detail for their safety, but a lot of the indigenous people in that region you know, exercise domestic violence, meaning their the husbands beat their wives, and that's a culturally accepted thing. And similarly, they also do animal, but also child sacrifices, uh, you know, killing, sacrificing for their their pole gods. But when they learned about God and what it means, instead of being presented in a way, you must do this, you cannot do this. Rather, it was more from the context of if God loves you, and if God says to love your wife, for example, then naturally for them, I think as part of that transformation, they're not going to want to beat their wives, right? Yeah. So it, it, it has a human rights implication, but it's done in a way that is not legalistic and dogmatic, but it's changing people's hearts and in turn that changes their cognitive and their principles. And that's really, I think, the, the key thing that you're talking about, which is hugely powerful. And I, I don't think there's a lot of NGOs uh, or nonprofits that are coming from that point of view that is instinctively unique and effective. Now, just to kind of wrap up for today, one of the things um, that I want to talk about, because uh, we're kind of running out of time, you did mention Village Savings and Loans Association programs and the 7 million VSA, L- VSLA member equity. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that um, I think there is literature that mentions, on average, the, the rural fa- farming family sequesters about some 7.5 metric tons of carbon. So... What is your organization doing in terms of carbon credits to compensate perhaps maybe the farmers, but also make the make the nonprofits self-sustaining? 
Yeah, and that's a nut we are still trying to crack. Um, the verification protocols for that are, are fairly intense. I mean, we can we can calculate those numbers. Um, we're working on putting together a, a actually verified carbon project in the Dominican Republic right now, which would allow um, farmers to be compensated for for them, but. Uh, the process of actually verifying that carbon um, is is relatively complex and relatively intensive, and so we're having to do some some significant retooling to do that. Well, I you know I love that answer because of the fact that you guys are wrestling with it. I think there's just too many organizations that just more than gladly uh, accept those credits and figure out somehow. Uh, magically those numbers and accountability. But I, I I love the fact that you guys are really wrestling with it and trying to be as um, as exacting as possible. So that's very exciting. Now, as you celebrate your 30th year with Plant With Purpose, what's next for the organization and also for you? Um, well, one of the things that I think is is important is we've had a long time maybe too long, to validate the model, to figure out what works, to measure it, to see what works. And right now, our biggest challenge is scaling that um, without losing what works. And so that's that, that's part of what's next. We hope to to uh, you know double our impact. I think we took we to plant the first 50 million trees took 35 years and we're planning on planting the next 50 million in the next four. Um, already got the first 10, you know, so we're up to 60 now, um, done this year. But, um, so, so now that we've validated things, let's scale it. Let's, um, um, let it impact more people. The, the issue of environmental degradation, um, and poverty intersects in throughout the world, especially in, uh, in the tropics, you know, nearly a billion people make their living of subsistence farmers growing their own food, depending on their own land. And in most cases, that land is 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 badly degraded. So the application is huge. Very exciting. And with that, I have been joined by Scott Saban, CEO of Plant with Purpose. Thank you for joining. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.